us pray. Lord God, you have brought love and immortality to light through Jesus Christ. We pray that the Holy Spirit might shine the gospel in our hearts in the midst of frustrating and difficult times so that held together in the hope of you, we might have eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. The first time I met Shirley Jones, I knew right away we were going to be best friends. Shirley Jones was one of many people that I was tasked to visit my first week in a new parish. I was the senior pastor and the associate pastor was taking me around and having me meet all the shut-ins and all the people who were in homes and all the people who were in the hospital, you know, just to kind of get the lay of the land and know who's there. And so we went to go meet with Shirley Jones and we stopped by the care facility she was in, went by her room, she wasn't there. And so we took a risk and we went to kind of like a common room, like an activity room. And when we rounded the corner and saw her, she looked up from her puzzle and said, well, it's about time you got here. (laughs) I was like, oh boy, this is gonna be fun. And the associate pastor says, this is Pastor Sundquist. He's the new pastor. Um, We're just taking him around to meet people. And she began to give a litany of reasons why her life was frustrating and and filled with anger. And she talked about the frustration she had with her family who never came to see her. She talked about the frustration she had with her friends who didn't make the time to contact her. She talked about her frustration with the world and and with the government, but on the top of that list of people who were frustrating were her pastors. And she let us have it. And I thought to myself, we're about to be best friends. (laughs) We listened and we listened and my associate feeling kind of embarrassed, you know, because, you know, he wanted to justify himself that he had to, you know, come and visit her. And, and he said, well, I, I did come and visit her, but, uh, but it didn't matter. See, Shirley was frustrated because she felt invisible. She felt uncared for. She felt undervalued and she felt like everybody forgot she existed. So we said our prayer, and I said, I'll come back and visit you. And she said, we'll see. (laughs) So the very next day, I went to go visit Shirley. Now, I stopped by the general activity area because I thought maybe that's where she'd be with a puzzle, but she wasn't. She was in her room, and I went to visit her in her room, and she looked up when she saw me, and she was like, oh, you. And she did it again. She told me every frustration that she had in the world. She started with the government and with the world and with her family and with her friends. And finally she landed on the church. And I was like, oh, please help me, Jesus. Please help me to find a way past her frustration. I don't even know what to do. How many of you know people like this in your life? And so as she's letting me have it again for everything that's frustrating in her world, she lands on, towards the end, the church where she talks about, you know, I've done so much for people at church. I've cooked so many meals. I've given so much to church. I bet they wouldn't even make me a peanut butter sandwich if they knew I was in here. And I said, Shirley, I love you in Jesus. I'll be back. And she says, we'll see. <laughs> The very next day, I came back. And still, I I came to her door, I opened it, and still, it was like she didn't even miss a beat. She again hit that litany of everything that's possibly frustrating in her life. And finally, towards the end, when I could tell that she had kind of gone through her whole checklist of things that were frustrating to her, I said, Shirley, I just want you to know that I heard you yesterday. (laughs) I just want you to know that you are important. And I want you to know I made you a peanut butter sandwich. (laughs) And she, she laughed and she laughed and then she looked at it and said, there's crust on it. 
You know what's funny? I didn't go and see her again for a whole month. Now you would think that this would get me in trouble, right? Anybody? But after a month when I saw her again, she started laughing when she saw me. And she says, oh, here's the peanut butter pastor to the nurse who was running out of the room. <laughs> and it was as if we had just talked, like just the, the previous day. What I learned with Shirley is that it's not always the quantity of the times that you do something, but rather it's the quality of the things that you do that can really let people know that they're cared for, that they're loved, that they're seen, that they're valuable, that they are important. And I think that that's an important lesson for us today. And we learned that in Matthew chapter 1 with Joseph. We don't have a lot of quantity stories of Joseph in our Bible, do we? I mean, he's there for a couple of episodes and then he's just gone, right? There's not many stories of Joseph, but the quality of the stories that we have of Joseph and of Mary are very high, very high. Because it was to Joseph that the angel said, God is coming in this baby. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And he will save. And the quality of that announcement beat out any number of stories that we needed to hear in between. You see. What I like about the story in Matthew 1 is Jesus comes in a very common way, in a very simple way, in a very ordinary way, as ordinary as a peanut butter sandwich. What's more ordinary than a baby? And yet in this ordinary kind of coming, God gives a quality in Christ who is our Savior that changes the whole game and turns us from frustration and fear to love and hope. George Perriman is one of the toughest guys I've ever met. He's one of those army tough kind of guys. Any army guys in here today? Yeah. Any military tough people here today? Yeah. I see you back there. And he's one of those guys who's so strong and he's so proud and, and, and he just likes to get things done himself that by the end of his life, when he got sick, he was really frustrated. The doctors told him that he had Parkinson's-like symptoms. Now, they called it Parkinson's-like symptoms because, well, they didn't know what was going on inside of him. You see, though he was very clear in his mind and very capable in his mind, his body had betrayed him, and he could not do the things that he wanted to do. Something as simple as just walking, for instance. And this frustrated him because he could think and he could speak and he could... He could go places in his mind, but his body just wouldn't let him get there. And so here's what the doctors thought to do. They said, we're going to give you a walker. And he hated having a walker. There was nothing more frustrating to him than having a walker. They gave him a walker and they said, every time that you stop, every time that your body can't go, we want you to hold on to the brakes of this walker. And what happens when he hits the brakes is it projects a thin red line on the ground. And they said, here's what you got to do. Whenever you get stalled out, you got to look at that thin red line and you got to tell yourself, you got to tell your mind, you got to focus on it, you got to say, just get across the line. And if you do that, then you'll start walking. And sure enough, it worked. It worked until somebody would see him and say, hey, George! And then he was frustrated all over again. George's life was filled with frustration because... His body had betrayed him. I used to see him leaving church and he was frustrated. His wife was frustrated as he's just trying to get in the car. But he just can't. And so I was coming to visit George and I was doing what pastors do. I planned a whole devotion that I'm sure I knew where he was going to get some meaning out of it and where he was going to pause. And then we would have some communion and then we'd pray and then I'd leave. I had the whole thing planned out from beginning to end. Pastors do that. They actually plan what they're going to speak. I know it doesn't seem like it right now, but it's true. 
And so the devotion I had planned for my visit with George was from the Mount of Transfiguration, and I thought, well, this is easy. It's a home run. It's right out of the park. I could talk about Moses and Elijah and how, how the law and the prophets point to the validity of Jesus as the Messiah, and they needed to see that, and, and Jesus is the Messiah for us too, and then we'll have some communion, and then we'll go. That was my devotion that I had planned with George. The second that I walked through the door, he began to unload onto me all of the frustration that he had about how his body was betraying him. The doctors didn't know what was going on and how his family was frustrated. And then he went even further and he says, and I'm just so ashamed because there was this time when my grandson was at the house with us and I, I couldn't get going and I got so frustrated, Pastor Bob, that I cursed. And he says, I just feel so ashamed because I'm supposed to be a good example to my family, especially to my grandson. He says, what am I supposed to do? And I realized at that moment that my devotion was entirely useless. It didn't say, say one thing to George and what he was going through in his life, and I didn't know what to do. And in such instances, Grant, here's what I do, I just pray. <laughs> and so I prayed and and I said, George, I think you can actually relate to somebody in the story of the Mount of Transfiguration. And he says, oh, who? And I says, you can relate to Moses. And he said, really? I said, yeah. By the end of Moses' life, he was on top of Mount Nebo in the Pisgah Valley, and he wanted to go into the Promised Land. He saw the Jordan River as this thin blue line, and all he wanted to do was cross that thin blue line. He wanted to go into the Promised Land, but he had this problem, you see. You see, there was this time at the waters of Meribah that he was just so frustrated with God's people and he was just so frustrated with himself that he took his staff and he beat the rock twice and he cursed the people and he cursed God. And God, in that moment, saw him and said, Moses, you're not going to go into the promised land. Not in that way. Moses, you will die on this side of the Jordan. And so by the end of his life, all Moses wanted to do was cross that thin blue line, but, but he couldn't. And I looked at George and I said, but George, you know that Moses made it to the promised land. And he said, really? I said, of course. Look at our reading for today. The Mount of Transfiguration. Who was there at the Mount of Transfiguration? It was Elijah and it was Moses. And he goes, yeah. He said, Moses made it to the promised land. Yes, he made it to the promised land, but Moses made it into the promised land. But it would have to be Jesus who got him there. You see? And he goes, ah. Huh. He said, George, I don't know what's going to happen with what you're going through. I don't know if you're going to die with this disease. But George, I want you to know that even if you die with this disease, that you will make it to the promised land. And he says, yeah, because Jesus will get me there. Friends, that truth, that hope that George has is the very truth and hope that Matthew chapter 1 wants to communicate to you today. See, God sent Jesus not just to Mary and to Joseph, but by the power of his word and through faith in your hearts to believe it, he has sent that same word into your hearts, the truth that the Messiah, Jesus, has come even for you. Even for you. Because he will save, and he will, and he does. Now, he's not going to save us because we went up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He saved us because Jesus went up to the Mount of Calvary and there he died to pay for our sins. And then three days later, he rose again to secure for us the forgiveness of sins eternally so that no matter what's going on in your life or how frustrated you get, you are covered by Christ fully and freely. And that truth is important for you to hear today because how many of you can admit that life has been a little frustrating. Anybody? <laughs> yeah. It's been more than a little frustrating. 
but you have the same hope that Mary did. And you have the same hope that Joseph did. Hope in the God who saves. And by faith in this truth in Jesus, you are saved. It's like a light that you hold inside of yourself in this dark world. Now I know you know the story of Joseph and Mary, but what you may not know is kind of some cultural facts of what happened in Joseph and Mary's story. Cultural facts that might be hard for us because it's not our culture, and so it won't make a lot of sense to us. It might even scandalize us, but it is what was going on back in the day. See, back in the day, if you were a young man and you wanted to get married, you, you didn't just kind of assume that that could happen. There were no uh, small wedding chapels like we have here in Vegas that you could just run off and go get hitched. There was no hitching posts. If you wanted to be married, if you wanted to be responsible, you had to make a plan. You had to make a plan with your business. You had to plan to work for 20 to 30 years before you even thought of having a family. That's how it worked back then. And so when Joseph, as a young man, decided that he wanted to go into the carpentry business, he also contracted with a family in town who just had a little baby girl. <laughs> and he says, in about 20 or 30 years, depending on how good business is, I'll come back and I'll marry that girl. And I know that's weird to us. And that's kind of like, what? But that's just kind of how it worked. That's how it worked back then. And so can you imagine how frustrated Joseph was when his fiance comes up to him and says, I'm pregnant. It's from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> can you imagine how frustrated he was? Seriously. It's as if his whole job, his whole point was just ruined. But God intervened in the midst of his frustration and said, this is no ordinary story and this is no ordinary baby, Joseph. You may feel like you've lost your job, <laughs> but I've got a new job for you, Joseph. Your job is to guard and protect Mary as she gives birth to the Messiah. Your job, Joseph, is to guard and protect Mary and to guard and protect this Jesus until the day when he will deliver all people from their sins. That's your job, Joseph. So though he felt like he lost his job, here's Mary who has a new job, and it turns out her job is the answer to everybody's prayers. And so he diminishes and she increases, and he goes, this feels backwards, but this is the doing of the Lord. And so with faith and with trust, he accepts this and he accepts his new job. And maybe that's the job of the church today. Maybe the job of the church today is to guard and protect this gospel. Maybe that's our job. To guard and protect this gospel truth that Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ is here with us and he is here to save to guard and protect this gospel against a world filled with corruption and with slander and with lies, to be a church where the lights are still on. <laughs> Aren't you glad the lights are still on at church? To be a light into a dark world, a world filled with frustration and fear, and to say that God is here, here to save. In Jesus' name, amen.